what, why I came out here in the snow today to talk to you is because environmental socialization is one of those things that will get in the way of having a dog that performs at a high level. Now, I got a little footage in this video of me socializing a dog and taking them out and, and, uh, and putting them in different environments in the summertime. You've seen a million videos of me at the river, me at the lake, me in the creek, right? And uh, a few videos of me in the snow. Now, when it snows, these dogs come out and they, they pick their feet up and they're shivering and they don't know what to do at first. So very first thing we do on cold days or snowy days is we get them moving, guys. Okay, because remember, a tired dog is a good dog. Now, once we get them moving, right, then their appetites come back up and they acclimate to the uh, uh, snow. So they get kind of warm. The movement causes them to get warm. They get acclimated to the snow just because they're moving around and shaking and, and sliding. And so they realize it's kind of fun. And, of course, being out in the cold burns a lot of calories, so they get hungry. So really, these kind of days provide real awesome opportunities to get out and do dog training. Now... Some of the things that will bother you on cold weather days like this is your hands. If you're doing food work or even leash and collar work, your hands will get real cold and you lose a little bit of dexterity in your fingers, right? So like if you're not well acclimated to the cold, then when you go out and you're going to socialize your dog to this kind of weather, you're going to well, desensitize them really is a better word to this kind of weather. You know, what you're thinking is that you're going to do uh, your exercises through progressive exposure. So you start off with a few minutes outside, say five, then 10, then 20, then 30, then an hour, right? And before you know it, you'll be like me. You're just like a cow. You just are outside and you don't really think about the weather, right? I just stand here and talk about dogs. I'm immune to the weather, okay? Now, so when you go outside, right? and there's snow on the ground and it's cold and your fingers are stiff right and you don't want tons of dog slobber on your fingers right then just do some learning by doing that's what i call it learning by doing so you know you're familiar with my small challenges course right and so what i'm going to do is i'm going to take three dogs uh, one of them is a big neapolitan mastiff puppy and it can't actually negotiate obstacles so it's just going to follow along with us then i've got a bull mass a bull terrier puppy and a chocolate lab puppy and i'm going to do the obstacles with the dog and we're going to work on gross motor patterns and progressive uh, exposure to these elements, right? Because there's a lot of textures underlying the snow. We got snow, we got a little bit of frozen ice, then we got wood and block and uh, uh, various other type plastics, uh, various other type of materials that when the dogs put their feet on them, they're different textures. They feel different when they're real cold than they do when they're real hot. Okay, so that's what we're going to work on. Just follow along, and uh, we're going to do some. We're going to we're going to work on some learning by doing. Okay, so I'm going to come over here, get on my small challenges course, and start talking to my puppies. Come on, up! Oh, look, and that Neapolitan Mastiff can do this little one. Good. Here's this bull terrier. The bull terrier says, "What am I supposed to do?" And I'm like, "Follow me over that jump." So then I'm going to move to my next one. These are all gross motor patterns, guys. So, cause, so see, when I give these dogs these treats, my hands are getting a little slobbery, okay? And a big problem with get, doing treat work is you don't want to drop treats on the ground because then the dog stops paying attention to you and looks on the ground, right? So this makes it real easy. I'm not trying to fine-tune behavior here. I'm just walking around, and, and the dogs are following me, and when they hit upon the right thing to do, I say, hey, I appreciate that. You never let a good opportunity for learning to go away. See this here? See this board? And it's slippery, okay? Well, so when these dogs try to get up here on this board, it, look, they're going to slip and slide. So be a little bit careful. Don't get too high up off the ground unless you have a good, you know, solid uh, base for them to stand on. Okay, but I'm gonna let them you know, learn at their own pace. This chocolate lab is a little bit more sure-footed. Look at this Neapolitan Mastiff. It says, look, dude, I ain't getting up there. My big fat butt will fall off for sure. This bull terrier, oh, he's gonna get up here. Now, different dogs do better or worse in the cold based on a variety of factors. You know, exposure is one of those things, how much it's been exposed to a certain kind of physical environment, but also how the dog's built. Like, see this bull terrier? It doesn't have much in the way of a winter coat. <laughs> so it has to literally stay in motion the whole time we're out here to stay warm. Now, Eddie here, this lab, look, guys, I have a bunch of these lab puppies here, and uh, they don't even want to go in. 
They don't even want to go in the kennel. You know, they just, they'll, they'll go over there and lay down in the snow, you know, lay on their backs. And uh, we got a big creek out back. I go out back and, uh, man, they're trying to break through the ice and get in the water. And as long as they're moving, they're, listen, they, they don't get cold at all. And if, you know, even when they get kind of still, uh, they really don't get cold. You know, Eddie, he's got a nice coat. He's got a lot of fat on him. Keeps him warm. Very, very nice. Very nice. Now, this dog here is all muscle. This dog reminds me of myself, really, you know, all muscle, right? So it doesn't do us well in the cold. It needs a coat. <sighs> I'm just walking around. Now, I'm not, I'm not forcing anything here. Now, so you see this Neapolitan Mastiff. The Neapolitan Mastiff looked at those tires and said, nah. Then it looked at that board and said, nah. It looked at those railroad ties and it says, well, hell, are you crazy? I ain't getting way up there, right? But... It's not in trouble because I wasn't trying to tell her she had to do those things. So she says, I'm going to skip those. What about this, Tony? Can I come over here and try to negotiate this low-level obstacle? I'm like, sure. Low impact, you know, low, low, low liability if she was to slip a little bit because she's only a few inches off the ground. See? There we go. And we think about that stuff. Now I'm going to move on to my little dog walk here. More than likely, you'll see these puppies go right up it. And Eva will go right beside it. And that's okay because all we're doing today is learning by doing. I'm not trying to force the dogs into anything, you know. The, and, and the dogs, by not doing anything, they're not being disobedient. Because I haven't told them they have to. I'm just out here walking around in this snowy environment saying, come on guys, let's find something that's mentally and physically stimulating to do. Look, oh, look at that dog. You see, she picked her a little, she picked her a little obstacle there, and that's cool. I'm going to walk over here. Gonna start moving. Oh, and look at Eddie. Now Eddie, he knows what's up. So he's like, oh, oh, here and here comes this whole train. Very nice. We'll walk on over here. Good. Good. Now this kind of training, guys, is really fun because you can't hardly mess it up. You're just walking around and you understand that whatever you've been working on in your kitchen, you're not going to get that level of compliance or precision out in, out in this kind of weather. Right? For some perspective, let's take a look back at the video series I did last summer with Mr. Holmes, the aspiring search and rescue puppy. Now, Mr. Holmes came up here from Virginia, nice little Labrador. You'll probably remember me actually calling him the Labra Goat. I did so because he was such a natural climber, literally one of the most sure-footed dogs I've ever had the pleasure of working with. Now, here's some footage of us working on environmental socialization. And this footage is, uh, was taken down in Red River Gorge. And just as a side note, I don't know if you've ever been to Red River Gorge, but if you ever get a chance to come to Kentucky and block off a few days, I highly suggest visiting the Daniel Boone National Forest. Uh, it's, it's on par with any park in the country, I promise. It's got great rock climbing. It's got great natural rock formations, uh, access to awesome swimming holes. There's lots of adventure hiking and fishing. It's just really a great place to come camp with the family uh, or just to come do dog training. I mean, I go down there and camp and take dogs with me and we do tons and tons of dog training down there all the time. Like, look at that log back there. I mean, you're not going to get a better piece of dog training equipment than an old log across a creek. I promise you that. Now, after I posted this series, I, you know, I was flooded, I mean inundated, with people sending me videos and pictures of them out having just big time adventures with their puppies. You know, I mean, every day I would come in uh, for lunch and uh, there would be a ton of emails up here. Oh, hey, Stoney, we just climbed this hill. We just went up this mountain. We just went across this lake. We just did some boating, some kayaking, whatever it was. I mean, it was just one picture of dogs on boats after another. It was one picture of dogs in creeks after another. And uh, actually, it kind of ended up causing some trouble because a lot of the pictures were girls socializing their dogs and <laughs> they were wearing cutoff shorts or bikinis, right? <laughs> and so I would come in for lunch and my wife would just kind of be looking at me being like, oh, yep, here's 10 more pictures of girls in bikinis. And uh, I'd, I'd try to act disappointed, you know. I'd say, oh, I don't know why they're sending them to me, but I'll be honest with you. Of course, you know, I appreciated uh, the effort they went to. And uh, so I get a big kick out of that. But the weird thing is, as soon as the weather got cold, okay, I mean, just as soon as the weather got just at least a little bit chilly, all my dang pictures dried up. 
I didn't get any more pictures. I, you know, just as soon as that first frost last year, bam, I had to go cold turkey from the bikini pictures, which is it's hard on an old man like me. Now, uh, it's just kind of a funny way of drawing attention to the fact that uh, when people get cold, when the weather changes, uh, that dog training sometimes gets put on the back burner. And I understand why. The reality is that people just don't like to be cold. Now, that's why dog trainers get so busy during times of inclement weather. You know, listen, you can ask any dog trainer that runs a kennel and ask him when he's most busy. And he'll tell you, well, basically whenever the weather's bad. Because people don't want to go out when it's real hot and people don't want to go out when it's real cold. And, of course, if people aren't out exercising their dogs properly, then those dogs have excess energy. And that excess energy gets directed into general misbehaviors and negative tension-seeking patterns. That's the way it goes. And uh, along with that come housebreaking, you know. If a dog's not out moving, then uh, their, their elimination habits get off track. Uh, another thing that happens with little puppies, especially like if you're in Kentucky and don't get a lot of snow, you know, you've got puppies that they're not properly acclimated to being outside in real cold weather. So when they go outside to potty, even if they want to potty, they're so uncomfortable, they just can't hardly do it. Okay, so listen, there's a million reasons, just practical reasons that you need to get out and socialize your puppy regardless of the time of year it is. But for me, there's a bigger reason, an overarching reason, and that is mental and physical development. Okay, from my perspective, puppies need constant toes to nose stimulation. The brain and the nervous system is just like the musculoskeletal system. It needs to be stressed in order to grow properly. And what I mean by that is you want to get your dog out and you want to present real life problems. Like throughout this footage, as I've been talking and you're watching, watch all the things that Holmes has had to deal with. All the different textures and smells and 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 the, the, the water on his coat, the water getting in his ears, the water getting in his nose. There's a lot of stuff going on and his brain is having to learn learn to process that and while his brain is having to deal with all those environmental changes you know this brain's still having to go okay we're okay here but we got to keep our feet moving you know we have to swim for a little while we're going to walk for a little while we're going to climb for a little while wait a minute what's that smell is that a crawdad is that a frog right all those things are super important you know if you want a dog to develop properly you have to get them out and get as much physical and mental stimulation as possible when they're young now I know, look, it's a lot easier to get out and do environmental socialization in the summertime and the springtime. It's, uh, you know, that's why you see more people out in the summertime and the springtime. But look, I said, really, what's the difference? You know, in that previous clip, I was walking around with Mr. Holmes, and uh, he was following me, and we were investigating different physical environments. And here in this clip, I'm walking around my backfield with Maggie the Bull Terrier and Eddie the Chocolate Lab, and we're just exploring the physical environment. That's it. That's all there is to it. The only difference is I was wearing shorts before and now I'm wearing pants and a jacket. So no, no big deal. What I'm doing as the leader of these dogs, as the leader of this activity, is I'm saying, hey, let's get out and have fun. And that's what I'm trying to tell you is so important. It, during this imprinting stage, yes, it's very important for their body to understand like the specifics of how to feel hot or how to feel cold or how to deal with brush piles, how to deal with rocks in, in your pads, all that. It's very important. Okay, But what's more more important is the general pattern that you're going to overlay on the dog's brain of how to deal with physical adversity okay so if you have a puppy and you take them out for big adventures in the summertime then listen they're not going to really have a lot of trouble with what happens in the winter time conversely if you do a fantastic job with your environmental socialization during the winter you're not going to have too much trouble come summertime now, notice I said too much trouble, okay, because there's always going to be a certain amount of acclimation time required as you transition from season to season, okay? But the benefits of early socialization during the imprinting phase is that you overlay on the brain a pattern of dealing with adversity. And what I mean by that is dogs need to understand that there's a certain level of physical discomfort that comes with having a good time, right? A certain amount of adversity is required in life. And watch my kids here. Watch them fall off this sled. Boom. Well, I'm trying to resa raise resilient adults, so I don't whine. I don't let them whine. I just say, get back on the sled and let's get going. I'm the same way with the dogs, guys. It, dogs want to get out and they want to have a good time. They want to play rough. They want to climb. They want to chase. They want to bite and wrestle. But that doesn't come without a physical price. So ultimately, the key to success simply lies in our ability to convince our puppies that uh, things are going to work out. You know, I mean, listen, if you wanted to take all the leadership things in the world, all the books, 
books and this and that and the other and boil it down to one simple lesson. It's that if you follow me, things will work out. <laughs> I mean, I hate to make it that simple, you know, because there's a million dog training books on how to be a leader or whatever. But uh, ultimately, it's just, hey, follow me and things will work out. And if we have to go through a little bit of time where we're uncomfortable, if we have to do a little bit of extra exertion, if we have to get a little bit fatigued, don't sweat it because ultimately everything's going to work out and uh, we're going to have an awesome time. That's it. That's all there is to being a leader. And so get out there and teach your dog how to have a good time. Lead by example. You put the exertion level up first and that dog will follow. I promise it happens every time and I do it all month long. Every